Well, as everyone starts joining us today, I want to thank you uh, for, for joining us on the second installation of our series on a decade of US cyber strategy. Now, last week was really a kickoff to discuss the, um, the series um, and to discuss the, the importance of the co-edited book, which I have my uh, fellow co-editors here today, Dr. Michael Warner and Dr. Emily Goldman. The book is called 10 Years In, The, Im the Implementation of uh, Cyber, uh, of Strategy for Cyber. Um, and today we have um, a real, uh, a really wonderful honor of having an extraordinary group of panelists with us. Um, so we have, first of all, um, Admiral Jim Ellis. Admiral Ellis is the Annenberg Distinguished Fellow at Hoover. He had 39 years of service in the US Navy, but kind of most importantly for our conversation today, Admiral Ellis was the former commander of strategic command between 2002 and 2004, which are some really important years, um, especially in the development of US cyber strategy um, and US cyber command. We also have with us my, my fellow co-editors on this book, 10 years in, um, and that is Dr. Michael Warner. Dr. Michael Warner is the United States Cyber Command historian, and his most recent publication is The Use of Force for State Power. Uh, we also have the honor of having with us today, Dr. Emily Goldman, who is a strategist at US Cyber Command and was previously a cyber advisor to the Director of Policy and Planning of the Department of State. I think most importantly, and I, I don't think enough people know this, is that Dr. Emily Goldman is one of the primary pins on the Cyber Command strategic vision. Um, so she, um, I think sometimes with DOD, and um, big DOD strategy or big DOD documents, you don't always know the important people that really drove it. And um, I think today we're talking to someone who actually has very his was in charge of a very historical moment for cyber strategy. And maybe most importantly for those of us who are in the Palo Alto or Stanford area, Dr. Goldman is a Stanford alum. She received her PhD from Stanford University. So we have the honor of having a Stanford alumni with us today. Um, today we are going to be focusing on kind of um, the historical development of cyber strategy and then how that historical devel development of cyber strategy has led to different paradigms. And we'll conclude by kind of taking us to where we are today. So I really want to start with, um, with, with looking back a little. Um, and Admiral Ellis, I wanted to ask you first. So you were in command of strategic command from 2002 to 2004. And th this is a really, really pivotal time for DOD cyber. Um, also a really, really pivotal time for um, how the DOD was organizing its strategic resources in general. Um, for, for those of you who don't know, 2002 is when Strategic Command as we know it kind of came into being. Um, Space Command was dissolved. And at the time, Space Command was in tar charge of DOD's um, computer network attack, kind of the offensive cyber operations. And those came under um, Strategic Command at that time. Um, the other thing is that uh, happened at the time is that the computer network defense um, organization that was looking at kind of the defense side of computer networks and um, defense information systems agency, DISA, uh, was actually under strategic command as well at the time. Now, by 2004, cyber had become a domain and there had some, been some pretty significant changes with how the US was thinking about organizing cyber. So I wanted to ask you first, Admiral Ellis, oh, well, like, and, and actually, let me back up really quickly because I think I was remiss on something very important. Um, Dr. Goldman and Dr. Warner um, are, are currently employees of US Cyber Command, but they are here today in their own capacity. So nothing that they say is, um, is representative of US Cyber Command or US Cyber Command's um, opinions on any issues. I want to make sure I get that caveat. But um, back to Amra Ellis, I wanted to, to talk to you a little about what were your views then about cyber? Um, what did you think were the, the threats 
that, that were emerging around the horizon. Um, and what did you think, um, how did you think cyber operations were going to be used to influence and affect national security? Um, so kind of your thoughts on those initial days. Enjoying and reading your book of, uh, of the last 10 years and, uh, and your co-authors and, and the contributions they made, I, I, I feel like the old man of the sea with the sea standing for cyber here because uh, I've been around this for a, for a long, long time. And uh, as you point out, I, I took over at, uh, at, cyber, at uh, Strategic Command in the fall of 2001, actually immediately after the events of, uh, of the 11th of September. And it was a very dramatic time. Prior to that, though, uh, you know, people may not be aware. I know uh, Dr. Goldman and Dr. Warner certainly are we had a long interest and awareness that cyber was going to become more important. So there was a lot of disagreement about the slope of the curve in engineering parlance and, and how rapidly that would occur. But, you know, the results of exercises like eligible receiver in the late 90s and the like reminded us that that this was coming. I mean, I gave a, a talk to uh, as a lowly three star to a to a NATO commanders conference and, and talked about cyber threats in the in the late 90s. And and you know what would that ever constitute an Article Five threat? And of course, their initial reaction was never. And uh, and then I reminded them it could disable their banking system, drop their power grid, reduce them to a barter economy, create rioting in the streets, cause the fall of their government, those kinds of things potentially in the future. And at that point, they began to uh, to reconsider. So I don't want to imply that we were ignorant or ignoring it, but. It is fair to say that things changed dramatically in, uh, in 2000, 2001, uh, particularly with the, uh, the creation of, uh, you know, director of the Department of Homeland Security, the director of, uh, the, you know, DNI, the, the changes that came about as we confronted a myriad of threats and uh, we had missile defense that needed to be, uh, to be operationalized, uh, global C4 ISR, the detection uh, and the like. And so cyber, kind of got mixed into that broader portfolio of, of uh, responsibilities. And uh, and then when it migrated to Strategic Command in 2002, we worked hard to uh, to walk the chain that uh, that uh, uh, Emily and Michael know so well, uh, you know, from the authorities to the accountabilities to the uh, to the abilities. And uh, and how are we going to do that? How do we keep, uh, you know, NSA in the loop as a as a subordinate command, DISA in, in that context? How do we think about offensive and defensive? I mean, all these things uh, began to emerge, but they were in the middle of a of a very much more robust national security conversation. So uh, it wasn't that they were less important, it's just that they were competing with a lot of other uh, the challenges to the nation at that point. Really kind of taking that, um, that perspective and then moving to um, Dr. Warner, because um, Michael, your chapter explicitly outlays history and how history was so important to where Cyber Command is today. Um, and your chapter specifically kind of looks at some very pivotal moments in historical development. So I want to ask, just piggybacking on Admiral Alice, how important was that original relationship with strategic command? And how important has that been um, in the long run to what the U.S.'s and Department of Defense's cyber trajectory has turned out to be? No, it's a, it's a great question. The... Um... The move from Space Command, Space Command was kind of an odd fit for cyber, uh, and I think that it was probably placed under Space Command uh, really only because it was doing planning at the time. There weren't too many missions or operations or anything like this, and because it was global, it was it was something, it was a functional combatant command, Spacecom was, and um, the... I think the idea that uh, Secretary Rumsfeld had in 2002 to 2003 was to put it in a functional command that was going to be doing a lot broader mission set, that it was going to be helping in the war on terror, uh, as well as upholding the strategic deterrence mission there. And so now you're, you're operationalizing cyber. So I think this is a key moment here. And if I may, um, I, I don't want to usurp your prerogative here, uh, Jackie, but um, I, I just want to follow up with a question to Admiral Ellis, because at the time that he was there, the idea of dual hatting um, 
the National Security Agency and whatever cyber function was going to be coming up uh, was, was broached and was approved. And also a dual heading of DISA, the Defense Information Systems Agency, right. with what was ultimately Joint Task Force Global Network Operations also came at the same time. So if, if we can, um, I'm just wondering if Admiral Ellis can take credit for that idea of dual hatting or if he can, um, if he can share that credit with somebody else. Uh, Michael, thanks. And, uh, and, you know, quite frankly, you've got to go where the, I mean, it's the Willie Sutton approach. You have to go where the skills are. And uh, the, the need was so immediate uh, that we, uh, we saw the dual hatting is really the only viable option. We didn't have the time to build those capabilities and capacities. And even years later, as I, as I, as we worked the, once the authorities seemed to come, we, even with the dual hatting responsibilities, I was worried about, about, you know, the Department of Homeland Security that had certain cyber responsibilities uh, for the uh, civilian side. And my concern was, well, if in, in, in extremis as though is the line between, you know, civil and national security got blurred that, we might get handed that and and how do we keep plugged in how do we stay current so that we don't get lateral the ball at a time when we're when we're not expecting it those kinds of challenges going forward uh, were more of the organizational issues that needed to be considered and yeah it was a function of personalities uh, uh, to, as, as organizations always are and and leadership but i i think it, there really weren't many other viable options at the time, and uh, and that was the the quickest one. And then, as you know better than anyone, things continued to evolve with task forces and uh, and and other yeah. modifications that brought us, you know, back to where we are today and the roles that you both play in a in a, in a very focused organization. So uh, I don't know if I can take credit for it, but I certainly was supportive of it and uh, and saw it as the quickest near term solution to bringing the uh, the capabilities and skills we needed to a, to a threat that I saw is, is ramping up very rapidly. If I could just finish um, answering the question that you asked there for a second, um, Jackie, the um, strategic command was very important. The strategic command uh, has held this mission, the cyber mission, longer than any other branch or any other component of the uh, U.S. military from, uh, from 2002 on all the way up to 2018 when cyber command was uh, stood up as a functional command on its own. So strategic command sort of nurtured this all the way through. Uh, so it, it, it played a very important role. I want to um, take that comment and then move to Dr. Uh, Goldman, because Dr. Goldman's chapter is a really fascinating chapter, especially for us academics, because it introduces, I think it's a really great pairing actually with your uh, your chapter, Michael, because um, it's a, it talks about paradigms and how there are different frameworks by which we view and understand cyberspace. And she identifies a very specific shift, a Kudian shift between um, a deterrence paradigm and a persistence paradigm. And I wanted to ask um, specifically kind of, well, first, if you could help our audience by describing really what paradigms are. Um, and then secondly, if you could um, help us understand that shift between um, a deterrence paradigm and persistence paradigm, what, what are the differences um, and kind of where do these come from linking back to history? Um, thank you. And it's really a pleasure to be here and um, you know, on the panel with such an august group of um, speakers. Um, so, for, I mean, social scientists and philosophers of science can understand what a paradigm is. I think most simply, it's really a framework um, and a set of ideas that frame how you understand the world um, and, and how you see that world. And I think that for um, cyberspace, and it, it's important that it really um, originally um, kind of emerged both out of the intelligence community, but also was placed between the strategic, the strategic um, STRATCOM community. Um, these new capabilities, people were trying to understand, you know, what were the significance? How would they be used or not used? And it was just very natural to take the dominant thinking about force and about nuclear weapons in particular and apply those to cyberspace. And so we have um, conversations about, for example, a cyber Pearl harbor, a catastrophic attack, um, and significant incidents that are going to take down the grid. These were very much um, not that those 
are potentially possible, but it really kind of dominated the way we thought about um, the significance of these forces, these capabilities, how we should use them, how we should not use them, for what purpose. Um, and so I think what uh, the realization came essentially around, you know, well, Michael could probably speak more specifically, but in, so after the Arab Spring 2012-13, we began to see um, many countries operating in cyberspace much more assertively and much more continuously, and essentially doing activities that never really rose to the level that would have triggered a deterrent response. So it was really below um, the level of armed conflict. And this was ongoing. And at the time, um, uh, U.S. military cyber forces um, were really um, held in reserve. And it, the point was that they would not be used unless they were to respond to a significant incident. Um, and they might be used to try to deter behavior on the part of an adversary. They weren't sort of used in day-to-day in -day, um, activity, and there was a sense that what was occurring was not being contested by the U.S., that our forces were held in reserve um, past the point of, of, of military decision. Um, and essentially, adversaries were giving us, you know, engaging in death by a thousand cuts, and there was no talk that they were experiencing like that. So that led to a conversation based on what our adversaries were doing, based on lessons learned, that the command was going through um, in the, in the counter-ISIS fight, that, that we realized that in addition to maturing our capabilities and our organization and our command and control, we also had to mature our ideas about how to think about um, cyberspace forces, and 2018 really was that that pivot where um, the command published its vision, and it really called for um, U.S. cyber forces to be defending forward beyond outside near the information networks and to be engaging and pushing back on adversaries in this day-to-day -day competition um, whose cumulative effects were really having a strategic impact on the United States. So that we think that that kind of shift in thinking um, was in a way tantamount to what happened after World War II, where you had conventional force paradigms. Suddenly, nuclear weapons were there, and we realized that nuclear weapons, their value was in, in not using them, but deterring the use of them. So that was a real paradigm shift. We argued that what we see in cyberspace and our thinking is similarly a paradigm shift, aligning are thinking about the capabilities to the environment that they represent. Now, I want to follow up on what you just said, because we had a really great question that follows directly on um, this discussion of especially persistent engagement um, and that vision. And the question is, what have you learned since the vision was published? The vision was published in, I think, 2018, so we're coming up on almost three years. Um, and what assumptions did you get wrong? And what assumptions did you get right? Um, I think one of the things we learned is how hard it is to change paradigms. Um, I think that, you know, it's really been a socialization process explaining, um, you know, explaining the nature of how we understand cyberspace and how we think it's important to um, apply and use cyberspace forces. So I think that, that it's a continual socialization and education process, both within our organization, the global combatant commanders today, understand how cyber forces support their objectives as well. Um, so I think that that's one key point. I think one of the things if um, if I were to go back and we were to um, rewrite it was that there was a sense that we were not being mindful enough of potential risks um, and, and what the risks would be in use of forces. So of course there became a large conversation about um, the threat of escalation and that this more active approach on the part of U.S. cyber defense groups, DOD cyber forces, might lead to escalation. And I think, and Jackie, you've been a part of this, there really has been a very vibrant conversation in the scholarly and the practitioner community. And I think that there is an emerging consensus that we really have not seen that escalation um, to, uh, the, to, to, the, the, to the threshold of armed conflict. But I think that would have been um, one thing that, uh, I think we were mindful of internally, we didn't really express it as much in the vision as we should have. And I think uh, the third point, which I'll turn it over to, to 
Dr. Horner to Michael, um, is I think we learned the value and actually the, um, um, the, the importance of these concepts as they unfolded um, in the defense of the 2018 election. We actually got to see that um, in progress. I think it really validated um, for those who are doing it, they think that's really quite yeah, I would say that um, if the vision were to be written now, um, that probably what would go into it would be a, a little clearer idea of what it is that you're defending, what it is that you're protecting in cyberspace. And what has happened is, if we do this, we collectively in this nation in the cyber security community of interest have known that adversaries can sort of reach out toward into each other's societies much in three different um, centers of gravity or centers of power within those societies. First, their, their intellectual property, the way that they create and store wealth. They can touch on the security and the privacy of the citizens. They can touch on the legitimacy of the government uh, with, its, with its people, with its allies, with its creditors. And I think that the vision, if it were to be written today, would, would probably state that a little bit more clearly, a little bit more explicitly, to show what it is that cyberspace operations and a strategy of defending forward through persistent engagement is trying to help. The other thing that would probably go into the vision if it were to be written today would be a larger sense of private cybersecurity community and uh, how big that is and how important that is, how much actors in uh, places like Silicon Valley are really shaping the strategic environment, that they really are um, that they are forcing in a certain way, they're forcing even states to, to sort of um, adjust their thinking and sometimes even their strategies to the, the realities of that cyber environment there. Um, there's a lot that uh, companies like Microsoft, and companies, um, you know, other companies out there, even companies like FireEye or CrowdStrike, or like this, are doing to make it far harder for um, governments to operate in cyberspace or to do mischievous things in cyberspace. And um, that might have been, that added into the vision, that might have been considered more in the vision because a larger context uh, on what that vision and what that defense and what strategy is, uh, is trying to help. I want to take this question about assumptions and I want to take it back to Admiral Ellis. Um, especially since you haven't even, you have the honor of being able to look back on your decisions with even more <laughs> information that has trans that has transpired since you made your decisions back, you know, I think it's almost 20 years ago now. And so I'm interested in kind of what you've learned and since, you know, since your time at Strategic Command and then what assumptions that you guys had back then that have either since been um, maybe disproved or have really been solidified? No, that's a great question, Jackie. And, uh, and you know, hindsight being 2020, as it always is, we can see now that, uh, as, uh, as Michael just inferred, we, we attempted to translate classic deterrence and, and defense concepts into the cyber world. And, and perhaps we're not as aware as we could have or should have been that, uh, as in many cases, space is another example, the technology has outpaced the policy in, in a lot of ways. And we were thinking in terms of uh, firewalls, building them higher and thicker. And, uh, and only lately came to, you know, what I tout is the, the naval approach where you compartmentalize behind the firewalls like you do inside the hull of a ship so that assuming that you're going to reach some point, you, know, you can contain or prevent the spread of, uh, of that kind of an infection or, or an attack. But, uh, but I do think we, we were you know, hugely optimistic about the potential and not as nearly as, as, as understanding of how this threat was going to manifest itself. We thought of it as a nation state, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
red blue uh, kind of uh, kind of confrontation and uh, and as uh, as doctors Goldman and Warner have pointed out and you've pointed out in your book it's actually materialized in much different ways this was well before the sony attacks and the uh, and the you know much less our most recent experiences and uh, and and so we we tended to think about it in classic uh, uh, military terms and then uh, we saw that that just wasn't going to work, and it, it you, no matter you know we we initially failed to uh, to account for the insider threats, and then as things matured and evolved, uh, we got wiser. and And I think you know I, I don't want anyone to interpret that as uh, as as criticism. I think you have to learn and you have to understand these things as they evolve. It's a great quote from uh, from Merrick Hoffer that I like. In times of change. Uh, uh, the learners inherit the earth, while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. And in a sense, that's kind of the nature of, of, of human uh, approach to challenges. We want to put it in the context of something we've already done and something we understand. And in that case, this was so different and was becoming so ubiquitous and uh, and so intrusive with all of the uh, the implications that your audience uh, understands uh, far better than I, uh, we were we didn't initially structure ourselves and our approach to deterrence and defense in, uh, in 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 terms other than those that we with which we were familiar. Even as we idealized, I mean, I had colleagues that said we're going to be able to make an uh, enemy's missile defense system think it's a refrigerator. We're going to be able to do all these things. And yet we worked through our way through network centric warfare and found the vulnerabilities that all these nodes brought us. And, 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 and so we've learned along the way. And I think you've seen that in the evolution of organization and structure uh, to deal with this and certainly expertise uh, resident in, uh, uh, in, in Michael and Emily. So I want to um, ask, um, we've talked a lot about strategic command, but I've noticed as I'm watching kind of the narrative of cyber command, especially since it's unified over the last few years and kind of left the strategic command fold, that um, increasingly when the commander looks to build narratives or to build analogies, he's increasingly looking towards the special operations command, which has a different set of paradigms or frameworks that they're bringing um, to the fore. And I was interested kind of from all the panelists. So what if back in the day in 2004 or 2002, cyber had been lumped with kind of more of the terrorism threat and had been put under SOCOM at the time? How do we think that would have changed the trajectory of DOD cyber? Uh, let me take a stab first, so I can uh, uh, ask, ask the guy who owns one. I guess is 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 my point. You know, remember the 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 buzzword when the new strategic command was established that was we were recapturing and redefining the term strategic. It was no longer a euphemism for nuclear weapons, as important as critical as they are. It was going to address all things strategic and including missile defense, including cyber offense and defense, things that had global implications and the potential for global impact. And we were intended to serve and support all of the combatant commanders, including Special Operations Command and, and all the others. And so there was a, a, a logic to it that said, hey, it's gotta be somebody that's global. Uh, the Space Command had been disestablished. Uh, uh, to some degree, because we needed the structure and the billets to create Northern Command for for homeland security purposes and the like, and uh, and so there was a logic to it in terms of the global approach. Uh, you know, I can't speak for my friends, my many friends at uh, at Special Operations Command, but they kind of get a little antsy when you start talking global and large scale, and I mean they they tend to be a bit more focused and uh, and tactical and operational, even though what they do at the tactical level can have huge strategic impact. So I'm not implying that they wouldn't have taken it had they been given it, but Stratcom seemed to be the logical place. And even though I renamed, I, you know, we renamed and reorganized the command, I didn't change the name not just because I wanted to save the city of Omaha money and street signs, but because I wanted to re-emphasize the character of the word strategic in that context. And so that's the logic for putting it there, but uh, uh, Michael and Emily may have views on where why it might have been better placed elsewhere. If, if I might add a little bit to that, the, um, the operations that are 
really consuming the uh, this new cyber warfare capability. It was called Joint Functional Component Command Network Warfare. It was under Strategic Command. Uh, the chief of it was the dual-added uh, director of the National Security Agency. But the operations that it is engaged in um, from very early on are uh, counter-terror operations. They're operating against um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq and places like this. And so, in a sense, Jackie, what happened was the, the lessons, the first lessons that, 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 that we in this cyber community start taking on board, that we really start learning and building upon, are gained in that counterterrorism fight. And that remains kind of the center or the, the main line of effort for uh, offensive cyber operations for a long time, uh, you know, right up through the uh, Operation Going Symphony against uh, ISIS in 2016, 2017, in that time period then. And um, some of those lessons go, and some of the people involved, go directly into the, um, the, the operations to defend the, uh, the midterm elections in 2018. So there is, um, there is quite a bit of learning that's done in that counterterrorism fight. Uh, but it's an excellent question, though, um, if, if, this, if uh, Special Operations Command had conceived of itself in 2003 the way that it does now, um, they might have been happy to take on the mission, and uh, it probably would have gone in somewhat of a little different direction. Um, I just look, let me just add that I think that um, we might have seen a, a more of an openness to the operational use of cyber forces because of the nature of special operations command, and that. But, but there may have been that kind of different framing. The other pieces, um, just to you know, reiterate re what Michael said: the focus on the CT mission would have been counterterrorism mission would have been even even more prominent and. Um, it would be interesting to see how that would evolve today because um, we're seeing Special Operations Command trying now to think beyond the counterterrorism mission. And they're looking for, you know, their contribution to the great power competition. Um, and so, and, and looking for what does that mean for them in the cyberspace arena as well. So, um, you know, the mission evolution would have been interesting. And I think the, I think there would have been more of a culture of operationally using using um, cyber capabilities, certainly at the tactical level. So I want to get to some of these really wonderful questions that have been um, coming in. And I want to talk a little bit about, um, and this is probably something that um, that um, Admiral Ellis has thought a lot about as well as um, Dr. Goldman and Warner. It's how alliances have evolved in cyberspace. So do we see, you know, as in the last, you know, 20 years, our alliances have evolved, some have stayed, our alliances that we've had a very long time, you know, NATO, our relationships with Japan or South Korea. Are we seeing alliances in cybersecurity evolve along those same um, lanes? Or are we seeing a really different kind of um, relationship building in cybersecurity between our allies and partners than we did in other conventional or strategic domains? Well, you're going to have to get a perspective from uh, from a, a little bit uh, uh, more distant past. Yeah, I think Michael and Emily can can touch base on where I mean. Clearly, you, you can't do this alone. And uh, as with as many of the uh, uh, the issues that we address in national security, we're stronger and better served by by partnership with allies. But there are really complicating issues here. I mean, uh, you know, in the post 9/11 world, we we you know saw ourselves with an obligation to share intelligence uh, amongst ourselves. That was the reason we created uh, the National Intelligence Directorate and, and all of the things that came with it. And, and then we found a few years later that that had some drawbacks as well. And so there's that constant tension between uh, clearances and, and what you know we are allowed to share and what they are in turn allowed to share with us. But I think amongst uh, the five eyes and, and our most historic you know, critical historic partners, we, uh, we've been able to, uh, to craft a way forward. The challenge, and I think the opportunity is how to leverage that uh, to a wider range of, of folks who uh, 
not necessarily fully allies even. I mean, my, I've written some things lately with Jim Addis and others, that, you know, say, hey, we used to say, if they're not with us, they're against us. And, you know, my view is, hey, if they're not against us, they could be with us. And uh, and how do we partner with with those folks in the uh, at the right level uh, while preserving the, uh, you know, sources and methods issues that are always of concern in the uh, in the classified world and still uh, creating a much more robust partnership because, you know, as we all know, you need sensors to know what's going on. I mean, uh, Emily's talked powerfully about the need to to defend forward, and uh, and that implies a, an understanding and an appreciation that in many cases is incomplete without the perspective of allies and partners who live there and uh, and speak the language and understand the nuance and the and the slang and uh, and the the chat rooms and the. Uh, and the cyber cafe is much better than we ever could. So uh, that's a, a generic answer, but I'll uh, let them talk more specifically about where we are and what our goals are going forward. Um, yeah, let me, that's a um, great perspective. I think I would build on that by saying, um, you know, we have to realize that we're still very early in this um, kind of journey in cyberspace. And um, many of our, many of our, partners that we work with in other areas, they may have different views about what's appropriate to do in cyberspace and what is the meaning of sovereignty in cyberspace. Um, and you've seen, you know, different countries come out and make different, um, have positions on whether or not, you know, it is a violation of another state's sovereignty to operate in that space without their permission. And, and so I think that that um, creates, um, you know, differences within some of the countries that may be traditional allies, um, but that's evolving, okay? And I think that that just shows the kind of the immaturity of the normative space um, that we see um, here. I think another part is that, um, and certainly with our hunt forward operations that Cyber Command has, has done, um, where we're invited by a country in to help them hunt on their networks. I mean, many of these countries may not be, quote, traditional allies, um, but there's really a shared interest in there in, in making their systems more secure um, and that those should be used as launching points for um, adversary activity. And we know that um, often an adversary will operate um, in countries that maybe don't have as robust defenses. Um, so I do believe that it's 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 a whole of nation. We all have to work, you know, it's a partnership within the nation plus. Okay, so we have to be working with our allies and those may be not traditional allies, but some of them we may operate with very closely and do the most high-end operations and others we may be primarily defensive with. Um, so there has to be a real kind of openness to more like a, a coalition and how we put those coalitions together. Yeah. Just to emphasize the hunt forward operations, um, defensive operations are the bulk of operations in cyberspace. And something that really gets agreement and consensus very fast is that a lot of different countries do not want foreign powers operating in their government networks. Um, and the, 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 the number of, of countries that are interested in cooperating with uh, the hunt forward operations expands every year. Um, and, and it expands well beyond the uh, NATO and some of our traditional allies there. So that's a um, that's kind of a growth industry or growing field for, uh, for cyberspace operations. So I wanna ask um, you all to, to help with some lexicon. Um, and I think with this recent solar winds incident, there's been a very vibrant discussion and debate about what actually constitutes cyber attack. Um, and I have learned from being on the social media, part of the social media face of this debate that there is actually a very strong divide between what I think InfoSec practitioners would call a cyber attack and what those of us in the national security and maybe international law community would call a cyber attack. So I wanna get your perspective, um, all three of our panelists on um, the different differences um, between things like espionage, intellectual property theft, and mischief, and then things that are kind of really kind of national security and conflict. What is the difference between these kind of cyber operations? And then is our understanding of these, um, what these differences are, have they changed a lot over the the last 20 years? Are we fundamentally using the same um, kind of understandings of what is 
cyber conflict and what is not uh, that we brought to it in 2002? I'll start the ball rolling. Um, so we, I think um, I, I think there is um, within military doctrine there is a specific meaning of what attack is. And it includes disrupt, degrade, deny, defeat. So you have, I think, in the, um, the military doctrinal community, an understanding of the word attack. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that has the same meaning outside of that community. Um, and so I think um, there has been more of a, let's talk more about cyber effects operations. Like what types of effects are we trying to create? Are we trying to actually deny, degrade, disrupt, destroy, or is it simply collection? Okay, so we can kind of talk at, at that level. I think the word attack to me is not as useful. Um, I sort of think about it more in terms of cyber aggression because I think attack focuses on an incident or an episode. And what we're seeing that is strategic in cyberspace is that it is really campaigns of ongoing operations and intrusions that cumulatively have a strategic consequence. So when we focus, you know, as much as possible, we try to talk about, um, you know, what is the campaign? What is the ongoing set of objectives? And not to look at it in terms of an episodic stop and start, okay? We recognize that different operations have a beginning and an end, but we also realize, for example, with intellectual property theft, I mean, this has been going on for a very long period of time. Um, and so it's useful for us um, to think about what does it mean to deal with an ongoing campaign. So I'm not sure that an attack really makes sense. I think that I can turn this over to Michael now because I'm, I can lead you into this because I'm sure he would say that cyber is so much a part of conflict and war now that it doesn't even make sense to talk about cyber conflict and war, right? Just like we don't talk about the digital economy, talk about the economy, Conflict is going to have a cyber dimension, um, but I'll yeah. I, I would you. I would rather than talk about attacks, whether what are or what are attacks versus espionage or, or or whatever terms you want to use there. I would talk about force and the use of force. What is force? Force is simply power exerted against resistance. And if someone is making you do something that you would prefer not to do making you spend more money here, making you spend more time there, um, restricting the sorts of things that you would like to be doing there. In a sense, that's an act of force. And so what we're seeing a lot in cyberspace is that the campaigns, that, and this is a great term that, uh, that Dr. Goldman is bringing in here, these campaigns are forcing us to react. Um, you know, whether solar winds is an attack or an act of espionage or whatever you want to call it there, it is still forcing the United States to go through the United States and the U.S. economy and, and the American people and our allies and a lot of people who are, um, where a lot of our partners around the world are, are, it has forced us to spend a lot more time on these questions and in mediation and, and in all sorts of other ways where we'd rather be using those times to, to that, that time and those resources to build our economy to doing other things there. And so that's where I think this really um, becomes relevant. And I think that's a good place to be talking about there is the, is the use of force, what it is making you do and what, is, and what it is restricting you we're doing that. And I think when you talk about that, it gives a little more clarity. Well, I, and I can't add much to that. I, I think, it, you know, Jackie, to a large degree, it's a distinction without a difference. I mean, we we don't understand, you know, clearly when you, when you find an intruder, and I'm, I'm, you know, pontificating here a bit because the, your audience and certainly your panelists know this far better than I. I mean, it's it's unclear. I mean, is that a, is this a precursor to an attack? Is this a reconnaissance mission? Is it an exfiltration uh, effort on, on their part of intellectual property or the like? Or, they, or, or is it uh, intended to be detected so they get some sense of what our defensive capabilities are? I mean, there's there's a spy versus spy for those of you that are old enough to remember Mad Magazine uh, dialogue that's that's going on here, and uh, and we need to be mindful of that. But I, I don't, and I'm, I'm certainly not going to you know denigrate any any legal uh, 
folks that are attending, but we can get wrapped up in definitions and, and I don't think that they apply like so many other elements of this as Emily has, has, has spoken to and concepts of deterrence and the like have changed dramatically. I can, I can remember get, getting a legal opinion when we were discussing using some very rudimentary cyber capabilities uh, uh, two decades ago that, uh, well, I needed to get overflight rights uh, for my cyber effort uh, from countries uh, through whose servers this might go. And, you know, my rejoinder was, I, I can't even define what route these things might take should we ever use to uh, employ them. And so instead of getting overflight permission, I got a new lawyer. But but my, my point here is that, uh, you know, we, we tend to, even in our terminology, drag things back to things with which we are comfortable. And I'm not sure it fits anymore. We need to decide what does fit going forward and, and what that conversation needs to look like. But trying to pigeonhole it into, into concepts that perhaps are not as relevant in, in the cyber and for that matter, the space domain, I think uh, could cost us a lot of time and not be very productive at, at the end game. As, as uh, Emily has said, we need to worry about effects and the potential effects that are, that are coming and, and deal with those appropriately, whether it came from a nation state or you know, the euphemistic, uh, you know, kid in his mother's basement somewhere is, uh, is, is less important. It's funny listening to Admiral Ellis and the analogy you just gave. I know that was probably, you know, almost 20 years ago, but I, I thought, oh, well, actually that conversation could happen now. Uh, that is a very active debate actually still about what is appropriate and what is, I mean, your, um, your analogy uses the analogy of, of overflight. So obviously we're talking, you know, the person you're working with is probably in aviation, but, but now I think there's, people are asking the same questions and just using different words, you know, the question of digital sovereignty, for example. Um, so it's funny how, how little um, sometimes that we've actually moved forward on some of these really tough questions. And, and sometimes maybe we just keep turning and turning. Now I wanna to turn to the private sector because it's come up in, in quite a few of the questions. And, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about what could have been done differently. Um, what would you, Amra Ellis, have done differently with respect to the private sector, and then moving, pivoting towards um, Drs. Goldman and Dr. Warner, and, you know, three years out from the vision, did the vision effectively think about the integration or the uh, partnerships with, um, <clears throat> with private sector? Would you guys have done anything differently? Or if there's a rewrite coming in the next administration, um, would, would it be done any differently? As I mentioned earlier, if, uh, in a different way, had we anticipated how these things were going to evolve. In other words, if we had seen cyber in much less through the military lens and and three and more through the the social, economic, and geopolitical lens, uh, clearly those partnerships with the private sector would have been uh, uh, much more important. But to be fair, the private sector was nascent in its in those days as well, and and was was growing and, and ramping up. So uh, we we're kind of growing up together in a you know in a in a sense, and I'm not using that as an excuse, but uh, but you know without the private sector and the and the implications, I mean the 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 line between you know commercial and uh, and uh, and the private sector and national security has has long since been blurred, if not erased, and uh, and so I think that awareness. Uh, brings with it all the challenges of how do you make that integration work, uh, you know, for folks that have privacy concerns, that have, you know, shareholder concerns, that quite frankly have uh, social concerns in their workforce about uh, being a part of, of national security and, and those kinds of issues. Those are those are all now, you know, continually uh, uh, active in uh, in the conversation as as well they should be. Uh, but we would we would have started earlier and much more rapidly if we could have if we had seen more clearly. How this, how these lines were going to get blurred, and again, we were prisoners of our own experience. We were tending to think of it in a, initially, as uh, as Michael has said, a defensive way, and then ultimately uh, in a in a in a more uh, offensive oriented uh, approach. So, uh, uh, we now see what how things have, have moved, and uh, and the opportunity is still there. And I know we're wrestling with it still, but uh, but I think it's hugely important that we get this right. Can I just? Um emphasize a little bit the, uh, the great point that the admiral just made there. Um, these lines have always been blurred. 
uh, the, the development, the invention almost of cyberspace and computer security was always an academic industry and government enterprise with people sort of crossing uh, through these very formidable, I don't know, they, they weren't barriers, but uh, doors, I guess, between the rooms there. And uh, just to sort of illustrate that, uh, this wonderful studio where Emily and I are sitting now is at Dreamport, which is the innovation center for US Cyber Command. It is literally outside the wire. It's in an office park in suburban Maryland here. And it's where Cyber Command brings in people from industry to, to come up with ideas where, where we bring our ideas and they bring their ideas. And sometimes uh, and fairly often synergy happens between them there. And uh, I, I'm hoping that this is a uh, this sort of collaboration can 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 be built upon here. I think that people are getting more comfortable with it, and um, I think this is the only way we're going to get through some of these challenges ahead. Um, yeah, let let me just go back to the specific question you asked about um, you know the division envision enough of that. Um, I guess it's all and, you know. We were certainly aware of, you know, we were very cognizant of it because, as Michael said, I mean, you're, it's inherently a public private space. I mean, people, I mean, we, in the military, we say cyberspace is a domain, but really, cyberspace is, you know, a, a domain in which the military operates, right? And it's the private sector that builds it and really shapes the terrain that the military has to, um, to um, operate and maneuver through. Um, but I think if you go back to when we did the vision, there was this really specific purpose for it. And the purpose was to get DOD forces into the fight, to get them out of their virtual garrisons, and to make the, claim, the case for why those cyber capabilities should be more active. And so that was really, you know, at that time, that was the, um, the overriding consideration that the command was facing. The fact that those concepts were picked up and, 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 and reinforced in the DOD cyber strategy that was released in 2018 was a success. I, mean, I think it really sort of made that leap, but that was just the first step, right? And now there's obviously a whole range of other challenges that we face. I think going back to um, sort of the, the bringing it back to the questions you raised at the beginning about paradigm, um, Jackie, I think it's incumbent upon us to think about. What are some common paradigms that we share with the private sector across government and the private sector that we can we can frame cyberspace and what it represents in the same way, right? So we can begin to sort of think about how we can operate together um, in that space. And I think that the you know the, the paradigm that we have had you know prior to 2018, focusing on deterrence and coercion, you know coercion is something that the state does, right? The private sector doesn't coerce, right? not really a, I think, a set of um, framing that will resonate with those private sector actors who are out there in cyberspace, you know, operating every day across networks globally. So I think we need to, you know, solve the information sharing problem and the coordination and the integration. But along with that, what is the shared conceptual understanding that we can see ourselves in this kind of joint or collective enterprise together? Well, we are so close to the end of this panel, and so um, I have more questions than we can answer. So we are moving now to what I call the lightning round portion of our discussion. And this is when I ask extremely nuanced questions and give you one to two seconds to answer. Um, so here's where we get to you know, put the rubber to the road. Um, so I'm going to ask a question, and then... Um, I would ask each of the panelists to just give a very, very short answer, a short rejoinder to it. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, the most important personality in DOD cyber history? Keith Alexander. Keith Alexander, okay. That, that's not to take any way, anything away from Admiral Ellis. <laughs> that's, that's a, no, 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 no. Mike McConnell. Mike McConnell. Okay. The use of force. Is this a useful threshold or not for thinking about defining cyber activities? Yes. Uh, not as useful as you might uh, want it because of the lack of uh, effective BDA, uh, the ability to tell or assess the implications or impact. You're, you're going to have to have a kinetic backup. Cyber nuclear analogy. 
It's been used quite extensively in the history of cyber policy. Has it been useful for DOD cyber or not? Well, as a guy that owned them both, I think it's been useful, but it's not entirely accurate. Yeah. I would say less useful. Cyber war, likely to happen or not likely? Emily's right. It's either war or it's not. It's not one. Uh, it's not cyberspace or or maritime, for that matter. Every conflict now has a cyber dimension. The most important historical relationship for cyber command is it strategic command or the National Security Agency? NSA, by far. NSA. All right, we're all NSA here. Okay, so you are given the opportunity to present the number one priority in the DOD cyber budget for the next NDAA. What is it? Talent, how to build it, grow it, retain it. Effective public-private partnerships that really work. I think I would have to go with the resources for personnel. We've talked about paradigms. We went from deterrence to persistence. What's the next paradigm? Or will, will there be a next paradigm? Resilience. Woo! Uh, I go with Chris Demchak here. Um, what did she call it? With the, with the sort of the segmentation of, of cyberspace. We may be getting the, the oh the balkanization. I don't want to use that term. That sounds pejorative. Well, I really want to thank our our panelists today. This has been an extraordinary conversation, and I want to recommend for any of you that are interested in these conversations, please feel free to download the book that a lot of this is based on. Um, the book is called uh, Ten Years In, and if you Google it, you will actually find it on the Naval War College's website. Because it is a government publication, it is free. So feel free to download. Um, and I also want... Um, for anybody who has joined us, who this is a new conversation, or you know you've joined us before, the next one of these will be February 26th, and that'll be back at the 9:30 to 10:30 Pacific time. We'll be talking about cyberspace and warfare, and we have a really um, interesting panel for you on that day too. We have Dr. Josh Rovner from American University. We have um, retired Vice Admiral uh, T.J. White, who was the commander of CNMF and the um, Navy's um, cyber fleet. And then we have um, Lieutenant General um, Hawk, who's coming to us from the 16th Air Force, who is also commander of Cyber National Mission Forces. And finally, um, uh, my old reserve commander, um, Aaron Hughes, who is the former DASD of policy. So it will be a fantastic discussion. And I hope that you all join us. Thank you for spending a little bit of your time with us today. And thank you to my extraordinary panelists. Thanks, Jackie.